Becoming love. That's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Becoming love. Uh, last two weeks, I've launched out of a verse in Genesis 14, 14. Felt the Lord kind of put it on my heart to say, Abe, this year, I want my people born and trained and armed in the house of God. And I want you to think about that. First of all, are you saved? Are you born into God's family? Big, big deal. You want to be part of God's family. Okay, he wins. I don't know if you like playing sports, but I like being on the winning team. And he not only wins, he destroys the enemy. Like, it's not even a a, a game, okay? Um, So be born in the house and then trained and armed in the house. And I was thinking about these different things. Last, Last week, we talked about the Holy Spirit and how I said... It's probably the most important message for the Christian. Once you get born into the family of God and are saved, you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. It's absolutely imperative, and it doesn't necessarily happen in the same instance when you get saved. And so I went through that last week, and I talked about that, and I hopefully brought some understanding to you how that is two separate things. And God's saying, I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Open yourself up to him, let him fill you, and then guess what? You get filled and filled, and you stay filled, and you minister out of the overflow of your life. That's important, because if you don't minister out of the overflow of your life, you will burn out and get completely empty. But if you have overflow, that's what you give. And so I'm not coming up here. I don't, I don't pray for sermons. I really don't. I don't spend, I mean, I spend time in the Word, but it, most of my preparation is just hanging out with the Holy Spirit, hanging out with God, doing my own personal stuff, and you guys get to be a benefactor of that. <laughs> and, and I think that's a healthy way of doing things because then I'm not seeking God so that I can just get something for you. I'm seeking God for me, and I want to know you, Jesus, and then I get to share these things with you. So uh, we talked about being filled with the Spirit last week. And just the part of this verse in Genesis 14, 14 that stuck out to me this week was in the house that Abram gathered his trained servants who were born and armed and trained in his house. Um, and they went after Lot and pursued them as far as Dan. They went after their brothers. They went after those that were held captive. And I, and, um, I was thinking about this word in the house. And how many of you know God's family is also called the household of God? Ephesians 2.19, I think it is, 2.18 and 19. It says that uh, Jesus has redeemed us. He's, let, me, let me just throw that up there really quick. Do you have that, Ephesians 2.18 and 19? That's okay. You have to believe me. <laughs> Calls us the household of God. There it is. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. That's awesome. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And in a household, I think about um, the atmosphere of a household, and I think about my own household, and I think about the church household, and I believe there's something that's supposed to be very, very important in a household that needs to be directed by the Spirit of God, and it's called the atmosphere of your household. Um, how many know you can have good kids and good parents, but if you have a bad atmosphere in your household, it just breeds all kinds of things that shouldn't be there. And you might be born again, you might be spirit-filled, but we need to focus on the atmosphere of the household of God. What kind of atmosphere are we cultivating around our individual lives and cultivating in this church here that we call the household of God? What kind of, what kind of atmosphere is it? Is it welcoming? Is it loving? Is it peaceful? Or is it um, critiquing and criticizing and complaining? And you know, this is a, these are rhetorical questions, but I want you to know something that you can have a good seed and you can have good soil, but if you have a bad atmosphere, it's not going to grow. The Holy Spirit inside of you is good, amen? He's pure. He's a good seed, Okay? The spirit, the soil, the, um, you know, worship and the things that get fed to you a lot of times is good, but what kind of atmosphere do you have around you that is promoting growth? You can plant a seed into good soil and have everything right, have enough water, but if it's freezing cold out or if it's dry like a desert, it's not going to grow. 
And, and the atmosphere that God has put on my heart that I want to talk about tonight is love. We must have love as the primary atmosphere that is overrunning everything we do as, as the household of God. Can I get an amen? amen? Love. And it seems simple. We've, we've heard about love our entire life, but I know that this world, and you know that this world has no idea what love is. No idea. In fact, I'm going to read a scripture here, and it says that you don't even know what love is unless you know God. And so if you don't know God, i.e. outside of the household of God, which was all of us at one point, we did not know what love is. And yet love must be the overriding atmosphere and, um, uh, gosh, I can't think of the word I'm, I'm looking for, but love needs to be present in the household of God. So let's look at 1 John 4, 7 through 13. It says, beloved, I love that word. <clears throat> Let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So I want to tonight cause us to understand and believe the purpose for which God created us, which I believe the purpose God created us was to love, was to, when he said thy kingdom, when he said to his disciples in Matthew 6, 10, when you pray, pray this way, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I believe what he is saying is I want the atmosphere of heaven, which is completely and totally 100% love to be produced in you and through you in your atmosphere down here so that as it is in heaven, so it is on earth and love is a prevailing attitude of the world. That's what it means to see his kingdom come. Somebody wrote on Facebook the other day and I responded to it. They said, what is your definition of revival? What is your definition of revival? And I, there's some people stated some things and they were good and I thought about it and I thought, you know, my definition of revival is when this atmosphere and this world is becoming like, in the process of becoming like that which is in heaven. That's what, I mean, it's not just a hot service and everyone's fallen over and the Holy Spirit, I mean, like, that's awesome. I want that, absolutely. But what I'm talking about is, like, every day you are manifesting God's love and his character everywhere you go. And you're influencing your world with the love of God. And it's powerful. And people are, are getting stirred up and, and, and being born into the kingdom because love is happening. Now, um, I said, we don't have, you know, this world has no idea about what love is. I mean, put up there again, 1 John 4, 7. Look at this. It says, beloved, let us love one another for, for love is of God. Love is of God. Well, we love each other. You know, we love each other, say a man and a man. We love each other, therefore we get married. Is that of God? No. Just because you love, just because you have an emotional connection, that is not love. So everyone say, an emotional connection is not love. That's not the kind of love we're talking about here. It's not a warm, fuzzy feeling that you get. Love is much deeper than that. And the world has no idea about love. Um, we talk about loving our pizza. I love pizza. You know, I love my food. In fact, if you look up the word love in the Bible, the first time it's mentioned is when uh, Isaac says to Esau, make me some savory meat. I love it. <laughs> the first time love's mentioned in the Bible is about food. <laughs> and how many know that was after the fall of man? And out of the words of man said, I love my venison. <laughs> make some savory meat for me. <laughs> and I thought that was interesting. That's the first time love is mentioned. I'm talking about food. 
But the world has no idea about love. And if we're, open, if we're honest with ourselves, we have no idea what it means to love. I don't want to just pick on one thing. When I was a little kid, and, well, not even a little kid, you know, little kid, middle school, high school, you know, I told a girl I loved her. Had no idea what that meant. In fact, the only reason I said that was because um, she made me feel good about myself. I love you because you love me. Why do you love me? Well, because you make me feel so good about myself. Everybody say pathetic. <laughs> okay. But, you know, I didn't know any better. I was, I was schooled in the world. How many of you were schooled in the world? That was your first school. <laughs> and we learned a lot of wrong things in the world. And we had no idea what love is. And then you get saved. And then you, you, start, you, you start getting an idea of what love is. And you look at the cross of Jesus Christ and you say, oh, my goodness, that's love. That's when love is poured out for me. That's how much he loves me. But you got to renew your mind because if you don't renew your mind in what love really is, you'll be a Christian and carry with your Christian life a secular idea of love and then get into relationships of different kinds and think that you're in love. In reality, you're just in lust. Or in reality, you're just needing somebody to fulfill a lack in your life. God is love, right? And, and, and in him, is, uh, there's no lack at all. He is love. I, I want to make sure I don't get ahead of myself here. So I want us to understand and believe the purpose which God created us, and that's for love. Only when we're transformed back into what God originally created us to be are we truly fulfilled, are we truly fulfilling the purpose and destiny for which he created us. Love is why he created us. Because he's love, he created us, and he created us to be love. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. He doesn't have it. He doesn't feel it. He is it. He, he personifies love. Okay? Now, in the Bible, there's four different kinds of love. And if you don't know this, you can jot these down. There's four different kinds of love. The first kind of love mentioned in the Bible is eros. Eros is the word where, where we get the word erotic. It's a romantic, intimate love. Okay? The next kind of love is phileo, which is where the city of Philadelphia gets its brotherly love from. It's that kind of friendship love, a brotherly love. And then the next one is called storge, which is like your natural affection, like a, uh, you'd have natural affection for a, a brother you're related to or a, um, a mother has for a child. Natural affection. You have a natural love that's just there. Um, and then the last one, which is the one we're talking about tonight, is called agape. And if you've been in the church at all, you've heard the word agape. Agape is the unselfish and proactive concern for the welfare of all people. God's kind of love. It's an unselfish and proactive concern for all people. No matter who they are, it's a love, an intrinsic value placed upon people that can only come from God. And God has it for all of us. And when we're born again, he deposits that love inside of us. Okay? Love is agape. And last week, as I talked about being filled with the Spirit, if you are filled with the Spirit of God, you are filled with the love of God. You cannot be filled with the Spirit of God and, and, and hate your brother and not have love. You cannot... Um, be filled with the Spirit and be operating the gifts of the Spirit in a right way and, have, and not have love in your life. You have, if you're filled with the Spirit, you're filled with love. If you're filled with the Spirit, you're filled with love. I don't know. I, I just feel like I need to say that because there's so many people sometimes that I feel like, man, they're, they're boasting in their gifts and boasting in what God's done in their life and boasting how they do things, but then, but then they, you know, they say, Pastor Abe, I, I, I got this word, I got this, I got that. I mean, God's been showing me so this. And then in the next sentence, they cut down their brother or sister and say, well, you know, they just, um, that pastor of that church, you know, he's just this and that and this and that. You know, they wouldn't let me operate in my gift. And whether that's right or not, what I hear coming out of the spirit-filled believer is not love. And I just think we need to contend 
for love in our lives. You need to contend for it in your life. You need to contend for love in the atmosphere of your home and in your life. And if there's one thing you need to get right, it's allow the love of God to take over your life so that everything that comes out of you is love and can be characterized that way. And I'll tell you this, I'm not preaching this because I'm perfect at this. I'm a work in progress, but my aim every day is, God, I want your character and your love to flow out of my life. And so let that be our heart and desire tonight. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is your classic love, love scripture. And it says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I've become as a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I'm nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Wow. You could do all that stuff and still miss it if you don't have love. And here's your classic definition of what love is according to God. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. I think this is the key one to understanding love. Love is not self-seeking. I love you. Do you love me? Come on, say it. <laughs> it's not love. Well, I like the way she makes me feel. That's why I love her. Self-seeking. It's not love. Well, he does so many good things for me. I mean, he makes me feel so good. It makes me feel like the most important person in the world. It's not love. Self-seeking. Love is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Keeps no record of wrongs. Wow. You mean when you're operating in love and somebody wrongs you, it's like it's the first time and it never happened? Whoa. That's a, that's a tough one. And God doesn't want us to be walked on, but I'll tell you, he wants your heart so full of love that you are trusting in him and his justice more than you are you, your justice, and your revenge system. Okay? Oh, they did it again. Man, I forgave them because the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed me of all my sin. I can forgive you, and I'm going to, I'm, and I'm going to forgive you, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust I'm just going to commit my trust to God. And you know what? You, if you do good to me, praise the Lord. If you do bad to me, it's not going to change at all my love for you because my love is not contingent upon you. The moment your love is contingent upon somebody, it's gone from agape and it's gone to some other kind of worldly definition of love. But the moment uh, love comes out of context with, with this definition, it's not the kind of love we're talking about. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Verse seven, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, and love never fails. That's the kind of love where 1 John 4 eight says, God is love. God is this. God is love. And love is 100% pure. Love has nothing to do with self. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? It's not love. If it has to do with you and what you can get out of it, it's not love. Love gives. I love how the King James actually uh, translates this word agape in 1 Corinthians 13 is charity. Charity suffers long and is kind. We understand charity. What's the first thing you think of when you think of charity? Giving, right? At least I do. Giving. Love gives. Love does not take. Love gives because love has an adequate supply to give and is not worried about giving too much because there's always enough to give. And God created man in his likeness and in his image in the garden, didn't he? Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. What was that? Love. God made us in the image and likeness of love originally. Adam and Eve, they're born in love. They were created in love. And they needed nothing. 
And so since God is love, man was created to be love. And just, just so you guys know this when you're reading the Bible, um, I'll throw up there Genesis 5-2. When I'm talking about man, I'm talking about man and woman. And when the Bible talks about Adam, it's actually talking about mankind, both man, and, both man and woman. Let me just show you this really quick as we pass through this. Genesis 5-2, the Bible says, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Mankind, that's the New King James. But that word in the Hebrew is Adam. Adam. Made them mankind in the day that they were created. And so not just male was made in love, but female. And together they were called mankind and they were made in the image of God and they were made to love. God made us with no... He made us with, uh, lack, lacking nothing. He made us in love and there were no needs to be filled. Man did not, in the beginning, need to feel loved. He was loved by God, but he didn't need it. That's where God wants to bring us back to, through the Holy Spirit. But Adam did not need anything. Adam was not in the garden looking for acceptance. He wasn't looking for popularity. He was not ever, he never felt rejected. He never felt left out or undervalued. These are all things we feel in our life. He never felt uh, unappreciated. He never felt that way because he was he was complete in love. He never felt like God overlooked him. He never felt lonely. He never felt these things that we feel when we have a lack of love in our life. He was completely full of love. He had no insecurity, and there was zero self-consciousness about him. He was, he was love. And love doesn't need to be loved because love has love and love only gives. He has. And so when Eve was separated, when, when, when God created Eve out of Adam's rib, man's rib, ish and isha, that's man and woman in Hebrew, um, Adam had, his whole focus was what can I give? How can I serve? How can I be? I'm, I don't need anything from you but I want to give you everything that God has deposited in me. And Eve, she needed no, she did, needed no compliments. She needed nothing. She, she had everything she had in God because the Holy Spirit was inside of her in full capacity. And she had no needs of that man telling her, how, you know, man, you look beautiful today. And she had no need of that, even though Adam gave everything that was inside of him out through his mouth. You hear what I'm saying? They had no needs of anything, yet they, yet they flourished and displayed love constantly. But they didn't need it. Because they had it. They were it. God said to man, be fruitful and multiply. See, man was not created to consume things and need things. He said, take what I put inside of you and be fruitful and multiply. He did not say consume and go around needing things. But you see, when sin entered the human race, the Holy Spirit left and love and its eternal deposit left man and every single one of us are born uh, with a, with a love detriment in our life and we go around needing things, needing to be loved. Instead of being loved, we need to be loved. And I need you to tell me how awesome my sermon is because if, I, if you don't, I'm a basket case. That's wrong. And you need to tell me that that dress looks nice on me. Well, not me, but, you know, women. <laughs> and you need to fill me up because I'm needing love. That was never how God, God created man to be. Does God need anything? He doesn't need anything. He loves. Somebody says, well, God made man so that, man, so that God wouldn't be alone, as though he's lacking. You see, God is not lacking friendship. He has a pure love where he needs nothing from you. He needs nothing from you 
He wants you to experience love so that you can turn around and not need anything from people but love each other and promote the, promote the same atmosphere that he's got going on in his kingdom in your kingdom. So this, I, this, this feeling that we're all very, very aware of where I need people to say how, how good I'm doing. I need people to give me gifts and encouragement and strength. I need this stuff. You were never created that way when God originally made you, mankind, okay? Gary Chapman wrote a, a great book, and um, I, I, I think it is a great book, and it talks about the five love languages. How many of you ever heard of the five love, love languages? There's five ways that people speak and understand emotional love, and they're wrapped up in these five. Words of affirmation, I mean, speaking compliments, words of appreciation, things like, man, you look so sharp today in that suit, and thanks, man, you're, uh, you know, uh, um, you know you, you, your dress looks amazing, and uh, you're so brilliant and beautiful, I'm just so glad that I married you, you know, things like that. Quality time is the second one, where you're giving someone your undivided attention, and they just feel so loved when you hang out with them and you turn off your cell phone. And these are good things that you should exemplify if you have love in your heart and you want to love somebody, give them some quality time, give them words of affirmation. But these are things that love does when you love somebody. But if you have love inside of you, you need none of these things. Keyword need. Okay? The moment you need love is the moment you need to surrender to the Holy Spirit and say, God, I need you inside of me. Because if you're needing words of affirmation to feel good about yourself, you're lacking a spiritual deposit of love. If you need, big word, need quality time, well, I'm crabby because he hasn't spent any time with me. He's just, I mean, he's just he's spending time with his, his phone and you know, he's at work all the time and I just feel so drained because he hasn't spent time with me. If you need that, you don't need that. You need God to fill you with his spirit so that you can be love. And God never created one human being to scratch another human being's itch. That's not how God made us. He made us to be, be fruitful and multiply and take what's inside of you and do something with it. Be giving out, giving out, giving out, giving out. And when your supply is God, you can give out and never run dry. When you're operating out of abundance, you can give out and never run dry because he is filling you with his spirit and then what comes out of you is this excess. Quality time. The third love language is giving and receiving gifts. This is tangible objects that communicate love. I give you a ring, I'll give you this, and here's, um, you know, here's a... Whatever, here's, here's lunch. You know, I brought lunch to you. There's a gift for you. Um, whatever it might be. These are all good things to do. But if we need them, we're lacking love. Acts of service, doing things you know the other person would want you to do. I'm gonna do the dishes because I know my wife loves it when I do the dishes. Or I'm gonna fold the laundry because there's a mountain of laundry in the basement and she loves it when I just do it and she doesn't even have to ask me to do it. But if you need somebody to do something for you, I think you're getting the point. You don't need one person to fill up your love tank. You need to be filled up by God and then filling other people out of your abundance. And it just comes as a flow. I'm doing things not because I need anything from you or because, hey, I'm going to mark this down on my calendar and I gave you a back rub last night. That means you know what that means for tonight. What is that? <laughs> That's not love. And the last love language is physical touch. Holding hands, kissing, embracing. This is only for married couples. <laughs> no, brothers. But yeah, you know, I mean, the different ways we, we, we feel love. But before the fall, before sin, Adam and Eve were 
oozing with love in every love language. In every one of these love languages, there are just gifts and words of affirmation and quality time and physical touch. And, and what's the other one? Uh, giving and receiving gifts. I mean, they're just like, boo, 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 just, I mean, just love everywhere. And they couldn't, they couldn't outdo one another because they weren't chi- it wasn't a competition. It was just love being created and the kingdom of God manifesting itself in the Garden of Eden. And that's why it was called paradise because it was love and they didn't need anything. They were content. And God was the one that was filling them and giving them their love. So a conversation in the garden might have been something like this, maybe. Adam, you're doing such an amazing job tending the garden. I so appreciate your hard work. My pleasure, Eve. Did I ever tell you how incredibly beautiful and intelligent you are? In fact, I was just talking with God, thanking him for creating you. In fact, here is a gift for you. Oh, thanks, I don't need that, but you know what? I already made a gift for you, and here you go. (laughs) And hey, by the way, do you want to hold hands? Yes, absolutely. Hey, give me a kiss. Okay. I mean, (laughs) it was just completely selfless. It was completely looking out for the other person with no no, uh, selfish gain at all. That's what he originally created us to be. And it's almost like mystical and whimsical, this kind of land I'm creating, but this is this is, this is what it's supposed to look like in the kingdom of God. When I think about revival, I think about love being the dominant atmosphere of God's people. Where there is no backbiting, there's no strife, there's no contention. It's just, how can I serve you? Man, I'm praying for you. And I heard this is going on in your life. I want to be there for you. You know, we're, we're going to sincerely pray for you. And we're going to, you know, let's, let's you know, you, you need some money? Here, here you go. And you're operating this place of love where it's like you're not keeping track of how much you gave in the offering <laughs> or whatever. You know, you're just giving. You're just, it's just love. So man was created to love, not to need it. Sin caused man to be cut off from the source of love. And now instead of manifesting love, God, uh, instead of manifesting love, man rather, needed love. Man became something we call codependent. In this world that we live in, there's a psychology term called uh, codependency. It has to do with relation, relationships, and it's characterized by a person belonging to a dysfunctional, one-sided relationship where one person relies on the other for meeting nearly all of their emotional and self-esteem needs. I don't know about you, but I'll just be honest. I think I grew up codependent. I think everybody did. Because you grow, you grow up with a void of love in your life. You have no love. Therefore, you're find, trying to find something to fill your emotional needs. Everybody is, is born codependent with this deficiency where it's a one-sided relationship where a person relies on the other for meeting all their emotional and self-esteem needs. But when you come into the kingdom of God... Things are supposed to change. And the way it changes is not by you working harder. It comes by receiving his love. There's nothing that you can do to attain the love of God to fill the gap and void in your heart. You need to say, Jesus, I believe that you were create that you created to love that I was created for you to love me, and I was created to be love. So fill me with your love until I don't need anything from anybody. Until all I can do is is give what you've put inside of me. And you surrender your life to him by faith, and he'll fill you with his love. And you won't need the things that you've needed in the past. It's awesome to get them. I want you to give out words of affirmation and and quality time and acts of service and physical touch and all this stuff. Give it out, but don't need any of it. Your need, your codependency should not be on people or things or drugs or alcohol or popularity or status or approval. You should not need any of that. You should say, God, all I need is you. It's all I need. You're all I need, God. Fill me with yourself. I was not created to need anything but you, and I believe that, Lord, so fill my heart with your love. And when you do that, you're positioning yourself in a place where you can be full of everything God called you to be full of. Okay? Until we know God, 
in an intimate way, you guys. Not know about him, but until we know him in an intimate relational way, we're destined to live some level of codependency. Our codependency is dependent upon how, how intimate we are with God. 1 John 4, 8 said, he who does not love does not know God. Doesn't say he that does not love has not prayed a sinner's prayer. It doesn't say he that does not know, uh, does not love is not a churchgoer, is not tithe, does not sing on the worship team, does not preach from the Bible. It says he who does not love does not know God. That's in an intimate way. If you are experiencing a lack of love, it's not that that you're not saved. It's not that you're not doing what God's called you to do. It's not not that you're doing anything wrong necessarily. It's that you need to know God more. It's that you need to be intimate with him. And so in this world, many people are codependent on Drugs and alcohol and abusive relationships, things that are destroying you, but you can't live without them. You ever seen that guy or that girl that you're like, why are you still with them? You're not married to them, and they just beat you up all the time. Well, I love them. God wants to fill that void so that you need nothing but him, and therefore you can genuinely love somebody, because when you need somebody, you don't love them. When we say... I need you, I need you, I need you. What you're saying is, is I'm empty, I'm empty, I'm empty. What you're saying is, I need to know God. I need to know God, I need to know him. I need to know God. So God did not create man to be dependent on anything but himself. Like a parent-child relationship, he said, of such, the kingdom of God is like little children. Just like a parent-child relationship. My kids need me. That's okay. That's good. They're my kids. They need to need me. That's good. That's a good need. And I need to need my Heavenly Father. I need you, God. There's nothing else I need. John 15, 5. Look at this scripture. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. In other words, unless you're tapped into me, you cannot be who I created you to be. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Why? Because you need to love. You were created to love. And if you don't have love inside of you coming out of you, then you're looking for love and you can't do anything of what I originally created you to be. You're missing it. And as, because of it, you'll be unfulfilled. you feel like your life means nothing. you feel like there's no purpose, no direction. And you'll feel like there's just emptiness and why should I even live any longer? But I'm here to tell you, you were not created to consume things. You were created to be consumed by God and to have his love in you and through you so that you can pour that out to other people. That's why you were created. And until you surrender your life and get to know him and know his love, you will go about being empty and unfulfilled and distressed and distraught and probably seeking some way out of this life because I'm not getting my needs met. God came to meet our needs and his name is Jesus Christ. And he came in the, in, in the Holy Spirit to fill our lives. And he is, he is more than able to fill all of us to a complete and full capacity so that none of us need each other, but we all want to display love to one another. In every way. Sin destroyed us, you guys. It absolutely destroyed everything that we were supposed to be. And then Jesus came and he saved us. And he sent back the Holy Spirit and put his life in us, his life and his love that we were originally created with. So you would say, Abe, I'm, I'm saved, I'm born again, but I still need things. I would encourage you, get to know God. The Bible says Adam knew his wife Eve and she bare a son. This is not I know about God. This is I, 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 I hang out with him. I'm intimate with him. And I'm, not getting, I'm not saying get... Don't take this analogy too far. You know, we don't procreate with God or anything like that. But what I'm saying is we talk with him. 
You, you read his word to get to know him, not so you can find out an answer, but so that you can get to know, God, show me your heart, show me who you are. He is so gracious to work with us that we can, we can start down the wrong path of, of investigating his word and he'll actually woo us into a relationship with him because he's that good. But we, we need to know him. Uh, I actually have my mother-in-law's, this is my mother-in-law's Bible that I read and it says in here, I just love it. It says, this was given to my wife and then I took it from her because um, <laughs> I needed a Bible. <laughs> and I've had it now for a long time. Um, sorry. <laughs> you have your Bible. Okay, it says, it says this. No, underlined, no God, Rosie. No God, exclamation point in big caps. Don't just know about him. Know him. Exclamation point, love mom, 321, 1999. Don't just know about him. Know him. Know him. Be intimate with him. Talk to him. Hang out with him. Let him be the most important thing in your life. Let him be the thing that, that gives you life so that, so that you're, never, you're, you're never set on edge because you didn't get something in this life from somebody or from something. Doesn't matter if my favorite show got canceled. I'm fine. Doesn't matter if my team won or lost. I'm fine. Doesn't matter if my wife was nice or mean or, if, or, if, or if, if, if we've had physical touch in a year. It doesn't matter. Now, listen to me. I'm not saying those things are necessarily healthy to go through, but all I'm saying is if you need that, then you are lacking intimacy with God. I want to be balanced in this, but this is important. We need to love and not need it. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the, the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, it's going to produce love. Just what it's going to do. So I want to... Uh, encourage you guys our fight that we have in this world is the fight of faith to believe God's word to believe that we were originally created this way and that we lost it through sin but Jesus bought it back for us so that we can be who God originally created us to be so we can fulfill what we were originally created to, to be and to, and to fulfill but you gotta believe it what you believe about this makes all the difference in the world. What you believe about this makes all the difference in the world. And when you believe it and you let him fill you with everything that he is, you need nothing but him alone. I'm going to say this. Matthew 7, Jesus said, Many will say unto me in, in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things in your name? And he said, Depart from me. I never knew you. But those, in Daniel, it says, those who know their God will do great exploits. You've got to know him. Know him. Paul said, that I may know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know him. And so if you want to become who God originally created you to be, you've got to become love and you've got to receive him. And you've got to, when you, as you're a born-again believer in Christ, you need to Surrender every part of you and recognize that if you are going about needing things in this world, it's showing you a deficiency of your relationship with him. Identify it, get with him, and love him, and let him love you, okay? Lord, I just thank you for your word tonight. Thank you, God, that you created us in your likeness and in your image, in the person of love. And uh, God, I just pray that the word, God, that you shared tonight would spur us on and convict us to know you, God. And God, I just pray that nothing in this world, um, we would be drawn to nothing in this world, but we, when we feel ourselves being empty, Lord, we would come back to you and say, God, I, got, I lost sight of why you created me. I lost sight of of you, Lord, and fill us again with your love and with your spirit. This is what it means to be growing up in your house, God. And I pray, God, that the atmosphere of this house and the atmosphere of everyone's house, God, would be that of love, and we would strive, God, to love one another. So, 
So God, I just thank you for this. Thank you for your love, God, and your grace.